environment. And I decided to go at McGill and take a professional development certificate in business analysis. And uh, the same, like while I was studying, I was promoted within the company to my position that I'm currently right now. So uh, I just recently in February obtained my entry level in the business analysis. And I'm working right now to, to get my AAC, the Agile Analysis Certificate. And um, yeah, as it says here, I'm a proud mother of two boys. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ina. Let's, uh, let's hear from Martin now. Martin, if you can turn up your mic, your microphone. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Sorry. Okay. Never happens to me, but now it happens. <clears throat> All right. So I started uh, my business analysis journey more as a business intelligence analysis uh, back in 2007. But the BA bug caught me when I was uh, working on uh, as a SME as an analyst on data warehouse implementation. So I worked uh, through uh, the different uh, HR requirements to be a BA at my job at my my uh, company at the time. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that I, I was doing, but I wanted to go with a more senior role. So I did the professional development certificate in business analysis. It provided me with the tools to be more proficient. And eventually I landed a more senior role in 2020 uh, at the National Bank, uh, just three weeks before the pandemic. So right now I have a brand new pair of shoes sitting somewhere on the desk that I've never seen. <laughs> And uh, my name is George Brayson. Um, I'm an instructor here at the School of Continuing Study. I, I have been for the last uh, over 10 years now. Uh, time goes, flies by. I am a seasoned uh, BA, uh, over 30 years, 35 years as a, as a business analyst. And I just love uh, the profession that I've been working in. And now I have the opportunity to, to share with, uh, with students here at McGill. Another one of my passions is, uh, is working at the IBA. I've been a member of the IBA since it was founded in uh, 2003. Some of you might not know what the IBA is, the International Institute of Business Analysis. And uh, both myself and Dulcie uh, have been uh, our, our active uh, board members. And we're very involved with the uh, the association that have numerous certifications and um, just like to have fun uh, talking about business analysis, doing business analysis and engaging, uh, engaging not only students, but also our stakeholders in, the, in this domain. So glad to be here tonight. And our next person is Dulce. It's moi. It's moi. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Dulce Oliveira. I'm also an instructor here at uh, McGill, a school of continuing studies, uh, teaching business analysis with George. We were partners in crime. Uh, my background was in telecommunications, but my passion is business analysis. And I also taught project management, but I came back to business analysis. And so um, I'm also uh, involved in the IIBA and also creating the BABOC. The BABOC, you know, we have all these terms, right? But the business analysis body of knowledge, that was a fantastic uh, project. Uh, so that is uh, my passion is, is uh, teaching project uh, business analysis and bringing along the, you know, a new generation of BAs and it's amazing to see, you know, where people can take this profession. And so I'm so thrilled to be part of this panel tonight um, to uh, with 3 other amazing business analysts to talk about this and, uh, but. George, you talked about. Uh, Business analysis and the BABOC and IIBA. So, what is this? So, maybe we can go to the next um, to the next uh, slide. What is business analysis? Just so that we're all on the same wavelength. And so, if you ask ten different people, you'll get ten different answers. But as business analysts, we like to go to the source. You know, always go to the facts. And the source um, is the bo the business analysis body of knowledge. And this is what uh, that source says. It's the practice of enabling change in the context of an organization by defining needs and recommending solutions that deliver value to the stakeholders. So that's kind of a mouthful, but really, if you think about it, it's all about change. And, and we as business analysts enable that change. We identify what does the organization need and, uh, and what could possibly be some solutions to meet those needs. And George, if you put the next slide, it shows us that the 
business analysis really um, uh, it's, it's not just about, you know, during the execution of a project, it starts way before uh, in pre-project activities. Uh, business analysts are involved in strategy analysis. What, where, what are we doing? Why are we going there? And, and how do we get there? And then they're involved in the execution of, uh, of business analysis by uh, doing requirements analysis and design. And then um, in post-project activities as well. Uh, so there's a lot of room for growth and a lot of room for uh, all kinds of VAs, including these different perspectives that you see on the right. Uh, and some of us have been very involved in working in those uh, five dis distinctive perf um, perspectives, uh, like business architecture, uh, like agile, like IT that Ina mentioned, um, and uh, BI as well. You know that Martin mentioned. So it's a whole world out there. Uh, and so this brings us to the next um, slide, which is really about um, our thought process around the future. So business analysis is a, a fairly uh, young profession, if we can say that. Um, so it's been recognized for a few years now, but where is it going? And so we went to three different websites, uh, the IIBA, of course, uh, the International Institute of Business Analysis, modernanalyst.com, which is a fantastic website uh, for tools and other things that uh, BAs uh, can, uh, can use, and even LinkedIn. So LinkedIn was one of the sources um, that, uh, that we went to because um, they talked about the emerging jobs uh, in 2020 and, and BAs are in there. So, um, Let's let's get right to it and and uh, and ask. Um, in fact, uh, we all lived through this 2020 where COVID-19 hit like a like a you know a ton of bricks. So everyone is impacted. <clears throat> and in fact, um, what you see there at the bottom shows us that um, a Gartner uh, CFO study uh, tells us that two thirds of companies are planning to permanently shift some employees to remote work after the pandemic ends. So I'm going to ask uh, Martin, because you told us you have a, a brand new pair of shoes that you never <laughs> wore. So how has working remotely due to COVID-19 transformed uh, traditional approaches to business analysis for you? Uh, yes, well, it changed a lot of things. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the fact that it improves my personal life because I have less commuting. Uh, but work-wise, it's been a, kind of a challenge. Um, you know, I, I find that as we need to develop more soft skills, the soft skills are very important as a BA. Uh, it's human interactions are harder to achieve. Uh, I used to be more keen to knowing who's more change resistant, who's more uh, hesitant, who's more enthusiastic to help during uh, live meeting, in-person meetings. Now I find it a little harder to detect because, uh, you know, the collaboration tools are not up to uh, the level of being in person. There's a lot of collaboration tools, but one of the challenges that I have is since I work for a, uh, a bank, uh, security is like, top level, and I cannot install or uh, use any software that I want. The software has to be uh, has to be approved, right? Uh, so I have to make do with what I have. Uh, we have to get creative with the tools that we uh, that we use. So the, the challenge is there, but hopefully uh, in the coming years, uh, since uh, working remotely is going to be the, the norm, uh, we'll be we'll have access to a better and more optimized tool for BA collaboration. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, anybody else? Uh, any one of our other panelists want to uh, want to? Yeah, uh, I can add something. Uh, I want to share my experience because when I um, when the lockdown actually started, I was just right in the middle of my studies at McGill, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was not sure how these courses are going to happen. But I was very happy uh, to to be working from home, of course, and do all everything remotely. For me, uh, somebody who was just transitioning to a new role uh, of a position of a BA within my company, I realized what adapted, uh, adaptive really means because I needed to adapt to the new reality when I didn't even know how this reality was before I came here. <laughs> so um, I only had my powerful theoretical knowledge in my pocket, but I was convinced that I can climb that mountain. So I, I wasn't there to, to be stopped. 
That's fantastic, Ina. That you really lived, uh, you know, both worlds there. That that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and George, even you and I, we had to we had to transition and pivot as well, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, de definitely. We had to we had to pivot. We had to uh, readapt our course, uh, uh, considering uh, co considering the the remoteness and our students. Um, but uh, it it forced us to 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 work with some of the new newer tools and uh, the virtual tools, and we exploited them uh, quite uh, quite readily. So even though we're doing teaching synchronously, there's a lot of async work that we were also doing. It, it gave us uh, the chance to uh, to try some of that out, and that really uh, was uh, was great. Definitely. Yeah, it's fantastic. And the the doing virtual workshops was quite a challenge, wasn't it? And we're still doing it. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, George, uh, uh, one of the things that we found in uh, the research is that um, teams had to go from uh, doing they had to do agile, but also be agile. And this was unavoidable. And um, and Ina, you talked about that. You talked about pivoting and being uh, and and being. Uh, um, and being agile, yeah. and so a lot of us, I think, uh, re discovered very fast that we had we had to work fast. We had to work differently. Uh, it wasn't just about uh, theory about uh, doing agile, but now we had to really be agile in the in the in the correct sense of the word. We had to be fast. We had to turn around, and sometimes we didn't have a lot of time to do it. Right? Uh, it was from oh, in a week, let's go from. You know, meeting in person to doing this virtually. So uh, I think that uh, it's uh, it was a fantastic, a uh, fantastic way to work. And 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 like you said, you know, you know, we we were able to do it, and you lived it as well. So that's fantastic. Um, but there's another trend that we see emerging, which is very challenging as well, George. And if you can put the next slide on, please. And and that's about um, the fact that technology. Uh, is now essential across all areas of business operations, and there's a convergence right, of business and technology skills. And George, how have you seen this uh, throughout your uh, experience as a senior business analyst and as an instructor of business analysts? How do you see this uh, trend emerging? Yeah, there's a, this, this trend has been emerging for a couple of years. You know, we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, 5G, cloud computing, and Internet of Things. Uh, what's interesting now is we're surrounded by data. Everything can generate data. And uh, data means uh, sources of information. We used to have a lot of data that was um, what we called unstructured data. But today, a lot of the data is that that was considered unstructured, the eighty percent now is becoming the uh, the eighty percent that is structured. You think of things like facial recognition. Think of telemedicine, uh, the work that's being done in, in in those areas. So there's a lot of data that's being driven. So that that that, that digital transformation is extremely important for for uh, for business analysts to really embrace. And I love this diagram. This is a diagram from the IBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis, that Delvin uh, Fletcher, the president and CEO of IBA, uh, put together that really um, kind of um, shows these trends that's happening in our world of business analysis. So right in the center, you have business analysts, and around it, you have the different dimensions, the different perspectives. Right at the top, you have the business now analysis, you have the architecture side of it. On the right-hand side, you have more of the, um, what I call the business side of, uh, of business analysis, things like um, uh, design thinking, things like uh, uh, user experience, uh, uh, user interfacing, age, uh, agile and all that. And then on the left-hand side, you have all the, um, uh, the things that are really becoming more to the to, to the forefront, things like um, uh, cybersecurity, uh, cloud computing, uh, data analytics, and all that. And right now, um, we're seeking we're seeking to have business analysts that are much more polyvalent, much more generalist. And this is not only reflected in in, in the in the real life world, but also in the, in, in the reference. Uh, Dulcie mentioned before the business analysis body of knowledge, uh, version three, the latest version. Which includes five perspectives. Uh, what it did is really open, open, uh, uh, open our minds into thinking much broader than than just the business side, but also embracing the, the technology side. 
and um, with the IBA uh, and with version three and, and also with the other extensions of the, of the BABA, which is the international reference for, for business analysis that we use here at, uh, at McGill University. It, it really embraces this, this convergence of, uh, of business and technology. And we also see it in, in job recruiters, where uh, job recruiters now uh, are requesting um, BAs to be much more polyvalent than uh, than before. So uh, these are some of the some of the trends that that we're seeing here. And I know uh, Martin, uh, in in your world, uh, also you're, you're you're experiencing some of this uh, this shift happening, especially in, in the banks. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say that. Um... Even older system, because we know that financial system usually they, they rely at the core of older system, you know, older system that uh, we're used to building COBOL, the older technology. But now even that is being moving to the cloud. So we have projects where we are move we move older technology to brand new technology to cloud technology, and it creates a great challenge. Yeah, that's uh, and you know we're talking about legacy systems. And uh, I think that even the COVID was even a, uh, a kind of an enabler for that because we had to do things a lot faster than than before. We can say we'll we'll put that on the on a on a, on a side burner and keep that for for next year. Uh, we were faced with uh, with reality and we had to do things uh, uh, very uh, very quickly. Uh, we use the word agile uh, with, with great agility. So um, yeah, we were kind of forced. Uh, uh, to uh, to to really to really adapt uh, that way. Uh, and I think it was a question of speed as well. Nothing that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I what I was saying is that one common denom denominator of all of this this new technology is the speed, it's the speed of communication, speed of deployment, speed of evolution. Everything is is created around speed. So I, I think personally, we have to redefine our uh, notion of success as a BA. Uh, successful, um, uh, successful, successful project uh, would probably all or the term fail often, fail fast. While well, those technology enable that, uh, so it's it's important for us to redefine our notion because it, it's not it's not that we need to be perfect in our analysis or in every assumption that we made. What we need as a BA to define our success is that we were able to optimize the use of the resource at the time. And, I, and again, you touch upon a key theme, uh, Martin, of mm -hmm. you know working in iterations, make the iterations as small as, as possible, uh, so that you can get the feedback a lot a lot sooner, as opposed to creating a humongous document and then finding out a, a month later on that you were off, you were really off the target. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, this concept of working small, keeping things simple, iterations, constant feedback, and then incrementally uh, uh, building in, in that manner. Uh, engaging our stakeholders. So, uh, yeah, those are some key themes. Yeah. That we, and the framework of these technologies are built on that, on provided iteration. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, there's a third uh, trend, uh, I think, that we wanted to speak about, uh, and that's uh, other skills and techniques. So, um, we talked about uh, already the uh, you know, the convergence between technology and business, but there are other types of skills. And Martin, you touched a little bit on that when you talked about the soft skills, which is a word that sometimes is very, very misleading uh, as well, right? And uh, I think that, you know, you had a really good uh, experience around uh, visual thinking, which is one of the skills and techniques that VAs must, uh, they must become good at uh, to succeed yeah. in 2021. So you want to tell us about that, please? Yes, sure. Uh, for visual thinking, I would say uh, right now um, that we are remotely, the markers and sticky notes have just become digital and just become a must. <laughs> the visual thinking platforms, although Martin just was mentioning that uh, they're not that practical, but so uh, we still have to use them. Um, the most powerful for me, uh, I it would be, I would say, my first first experience, uh, the mind map. I consider it uh, a very important tool and that everybody needs just to monitor it. Uh, it is an effective creative uh, thinking tool uh, where you can expand all your thoughts about the processes, functionalities. Um, in this new reality of working from home, of course, it's a little bit more difficult to, uh, to use all the tools, but how I'm saying, I usually 
like to touch it, to draw it with my hands. So, uh, so when you when you do it by hand, it's like usually you're acknowledging it, and more ideas can arise in the process of building this mind map. So I remember my first first experience when I just came at uh, McGill, and uh, there was a mind map about uh, to draw a mind map about who I who I am. And I remember that how I was fascinating about myself, discovering myself, actually. And even right now, I come back to that uh, because I had a picture of it. I remember like I'm, I'm like returning to it and um, return and read it in like difficult times, like reminding me who I am with that mind map. <laughs> so this Absolutely. is how, uh, how I visualize uh, the absolutely that that's an amazing experience because you discover the power of a visual thinking right and uh and yes. we have to as bas we have to move beyond the traditional text right um mm -hmm. you know when george and i first started as bas uh it was all about writing right i remember my first business requirement document was about 50 pages it was just text but how yeah. powerful are these images when we move beyond text beyond words we have to become better at that. Yeah, and and that, especially when using different colors and expanding it, like it's more um, exactly. understandable yeah. for everybody. The, again, there's all the psychological dimension as BAs, we're constantly working with stakeholders. So we need to appeal, we need to communicate better. And uh, what science tells us is that the, um, uh, we process visually, we process information uh, visually 60,000 times quicker when it's visual as opposed to text. So, which tells us, like, maybe we should, you know, wherever, wherever we have text, can we replace it with, a, with an image, uh, with, a, with an analogy or something like that? And it's kind of a level setter. Plus, we retain information. Our brain retains information in a visual format. So, it's only, it's only kind of normal that we go towards that. What we also see, we were talking about trends before, what we're also seeing in our BA world is uh, going towards abstraction using modeling. So again, we're getting away from the text. Text is the modeling language. We're getting more into 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 models, abstractions, but visual abstractions, and even tools. Um, I mean, some of the tools that we've uh, we've picked up during the COVID uh, crisis um, were were intuitive. We didn't have to go. No one went on a course. To use some of these tools, they were intuitive. They were very, very visual, uh, very little text to read, um, icons and uh, and whatnot. So again, the power of um, of visualization, uh, and again, getting in sync with our with the human brain is is uh, is incredible. Uh, I'd like to talk about design thinking in a moment, but I'm, I'm sure maybe Martin, you can drive off some points off of uh, uh, off of uh, what I I just uh, um, shared with you. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, like you, you know, uh, doing visual thinking, doing uh, abstraction doesn't mean that everything gets uh, that it's easier than writing words, than writing a big uh, set of requirements. Uh, to be able to achieve that, we have to be very masterful in the subject that we're working with, because simplification uh, is a hard thing to do. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I would just say that uh, as a BA, uh, we have to, I, I like to use the term renaissance man or woman. We have to both be masterful both in, in the science and the technology and the art of engagement, the art of visualization. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and this ties in well with the uh, design thinking uh, model again, uh, where we start with empathy. You know, to empathize. Uh, another word for empathize is walking in the in the shoes of our of our stakeholders again. Start to empathize. Um, know who our our stakeholders are. Really know who they are. And then, and then work towards defining the problem, the root causes of problems, and working on solutions. To ideate, come to use the word ideate now as a verb. To ideate, come up with uh, with different novel approaches, and then once we have this, rather than, than putting together hundreds of pages of of text like like Dulcie was alluding to, that we used to do uh, many many years ago. Um, let's say, can we play with this a little bit? Can we create a prototype? So this is kind of the third function within the the design uh, design thinking cycle. So again, let's prototype this, and prototyping doesn't mean 
you know, uh, getting some fancy tools. Prototyping means getting up to the whiteboard, uh, whether it be virtual or physical, and start sketching, sketching the, these thought process out. And it's incredible how engaging um, uh, these techniques are, much more engaging than, than using just plain old text. So, uh, yeah. Yes, and I think Martin, you had something to show us because to illustrate how you use some of these visual approaches to yes. you and your job. Oh yeah, well uh, yes. Since I, I do Lego modeling as a hobby, what I like to do is sometimes I take just a little set of bricks like that, single brick. It's not uh, it's not very complicated. Everybody knows that brick. You stack six of them, you put six of them together, and right now in your hand, you have 915 million possibilities of different combination of these. So how do we achieve the most optimized one for the project at hand? That's just wow. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. And as George was saying, it yeah. doesn't have to be complex, right? A prototype no. can be as simple as a Lego, uh, yeah. you know, some Legos, right? Uh, no, that, that was amazing, it was amazing. Um, Lego is perfect for prototyping. You take it. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and we know, uh, besides getting into visual thinking and design thinking, which is something that all BAs need to expand on, getting away from the spoken word beyond words and into the heads of the stakeholders, right? And getting more visual. But there's other challenges as well that face us as business owners that we have to be aware of uh, and we have to face and we have to get better at. And so, um, what challenges does the future hold? The very first one there on uh, on the on the slide is, and and some of you, you know, you've all kind of talked about it. Cybersecurity more than ever, and and uh, and the pandemic, uh, you know, working remotely, and and a lot of data going, you know, from from uh, you know the the, the homes of uh, of employees um and out in the cloud like this the whole the whole notion of cybersecurity is something that traditionally business analysts weren't you know too involved in it was always you know the IT department or the security department but George I know that you have you have a lot of uh you've you've put a lot of thought into this yeah so cybersecurity has been over 455 million uh cyber attacks in 2020 alone and we hear uh, we hear uh, ever so often of different instances, even here, right here in the Montreal market, where uh, different um, uh, industries have been broken into uh, from uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. So even though we think that maybe you know there's all the IT side of of, of cybersecurity, it starts with the business again, uh, on our business policies, our business rules, how they're enforced, and all that. Uh, so we're seeing again the merging of business and technology. Yes, there's the technology side of of cybersecurity, but it all starts with the uh, with the business and business policies and business rules that have to be uh, put in place. And uh, I'm so glad that the IBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis, have uh, one of their uh, most recent specialization certification is uh, is CCA, is a cyber uh, cybersecurity uh, certificate uh, an analysis uh, certificate. Um, in terms of looking at this from a from a business dimension, uh, so it's again when we're talking about uh, requirements, we're talking about non-functional requirements. Security requirements are are extremely important. They're, they're really killer. They're killer requirements. Sometimes you can have the best application, but if it's uh, if it's if it has these little loopholes in, um, it could really uh, bring you uh, bring you down or uh, take take the whole site down. So it's uh, something that we really have to uh, to get better at. I think Martin, you you have some some experience from the data side of it, having worked in in the uh, in the uh, in business intelligence side of uh, of this. And can you... Yes, well, uh, as far as security goes, you know, you know, what we've all every security breach is is a hacker trying to access data, right? So uh, data has been. As a business analyst, and you're talking about non functional requirement, has been harder to uh, to work with if you want. Uh, there, it's harder to achieve um, access to the data that you need to start your project. Uh, this is something that I've seen. Um, but you know, or if you if I talk only about data itself, um, I think that one of the challenge of the future 
uh, is the astounding amount of data that we have to work with. Uh, now we cannot just work with a simple Excel sheet and a simple select in SQL. We cannot do that anymore. Uh, we have to understand uh, statistics because the data is so large. Uh, now we have to to understand what is a linear regression, uh, what is a, a normal distribution, what's the difference between an average and a, uh, and a median, because this is the, the analysis that our, the data scientists will provide to us for our projects. So we have to understand what they're prov providing to us. Yes, again, what a challenge, right? Because again, uh, traditionally business analysts didn't go there. Very, we were mostly very, very focused on functional requirements. We became, you know, very, very good at that. But the non-functional requirements was more somebody else's business, right? And so, like uh, George and uh, and Martin, you were both saying this. As BAs, we have to get involved more. We have to educate ourselves more. We have to be part uh, of the discovery of these requirements when it comes to cybersecurity and uh, and and data and security analysis we have to become uh, uh experts at that to help the business because like George said you know it starts with the business and so we are business analysts analysts so you know it's a natural progression to that but you know it is a challenge because a lot of us were never exposed to that and so we have to first of all be aware and then really educate ourselves, uh, you know, in that. Uh, yeah. In that. Just as, as the last point, I can say that uh, personally, uh, we know we talk. We always talk about use case and exception and all that. I've been starting to introduce misuse cases in my project. <laughs> yeah. The cases where uh, the system could be abused. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and and the actor being a, a misuser, so a misuser, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. We're yeah. starting to see that, and actually, in in the UML notation, we kind of you know use a black a black and actor to show that you know uh, yeah. as as opposed to the the conventional UML uh, yeah. uh, convention for that. But yeah, that's a it's a good point, uh, Mark. Absolutely, like breaking, and and we've always been aware that we we need to be able to break the system, but there's a lot more focus on that now, uh, <laughs> you know, because. Uh, you blew me away, uh, George, when you mentioned 445 million cyber attacks just in one year, one year, and they're getting smarter, right? So yeah. we have to become, uh, you know, better at this as well. So um, basically, it's an arms race. There's always something better, and yeah. I knew there's always something, right? Yeah. But the opportunities for jobs, right? Uh, are are amazing and 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 a niche like a, a kind of a niche uh, as well for if you're really interested in that yeah so that's two of those challenges um, the next one you know going from um, uh, going from the uh, the technical cybersecurity side to the uh, product owner is an emerging job that was a revelation uh, for me when I saw that even LinkedIn uh, in their um, uh, in their emerging jobs report, a product owner was shown as an emerging job with a 24% annual growth in the U.S. And so product owner, uh, we always thought, oh, the product, you know, the bit, you know, there's someone in the, in the, there's a product manager and there's product life cycle, but, but now it, it's a different take for BAs, right? Um, it's, it's taking a product centric approach. Uh, it's uh, it's really looking at it from that perspective, and uh, and it's it's very interesting that the IIBA has recognized that product owner um, is the next uh, step uh, in the BA's uh, education, if you will, and certification. And they've just just recently uh, introduced the um, uh, the CCA, right, which is another. Um, uh, another uh, product owner uh, analysis. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the IIBA is always looking for what's next, and and they introduce the certification uh, so that BAs can go on that next uh, on that next step. And Georgia, do you want to say something about that? Uh, what's interesting about the P uh, product owner uh, when you look at the the, the the that role, when you look at the competencies that are required, and you start looking, it says, what does the product owner actually do? What does he need to do that job? And you start looking at it. Do they have to understand value? They have to understand business cases. They have to, you know, all this stuff. I said, wow, it's kind of overwhelming. But then again, there are a lot of the it's it's the same um, uh, competencies that uh, that a business analyst 
um, has or, or, or should have throughout their, their career as they, they, they build their, their career. So even though this, this role of a product owner is, has, has emerged kind of thing, um, you know, having, the, having this new certification by the IBA that just came out this week, uh, product owner analysts, it's, it's more, that's more the action side. How do I, how do I become a product owner? Is through the, the competencies of, of great analysis. Um, so it's uh, again when we saw the diagram before of the uh, uh, from Delvin Fletcher showing the business analysis in in the center with the kind of the the spider web or the kind of the, the hub and spoke uh, wheel uh, image. Uh, we had one of the branches on the business side really being the product owner and product owner analyst uh, uh, branch there. So again, um, our domain. Uh, of business analysis is very vast, and uh, again, uh, when the Babak went from version two to version three, uh, not only did it double in pages, we shouldn't be counting pages, but it it, it kind of doubled in size of of its reach, its scope, and uh, so uh, product owner uh, analysis definitely is, is within that. Mm, absolutely, you're so right, uh, George. Uh, and and the last uh, challenge that we found. Uh, in all the literature uh, is this notion of strategic thinking. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, we talked about um, the whole spectrum of business analysis and we started off pre project and, uh, you know, things like uh, a business cases, for example, that you mentioned, George, um, uh, feasibility studies, uh, financial aspects, all the things that uh, take place that have to take place before the decision is made, whether a project will start or not. Uh, those are um, business analysis activities uh, that uh, BAs have to learn better. They have to become better at that. Uh, and it's also part of being a senior business analyst. Um, so this strategic thinking, um, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, what are, what is the value in doing a certain project or in doing a certain portfolio, you know, there's business analysis um, techniques and, uh, that need to be uh, exercise to be able to make those decisions. Analysis is required to make those decisions, and they're not just financial decisions, but you know the whole notion of value. What value does this bring? Does this project or this portfolio bring to the organization? Again, as part of strategic thinking. And Ina, I know that you had a few uh, interesting uh, uh, experiences around this uh, this notion. You want to share with us, please. Well, I wanted to say about the uh, constant improvement on yourself, like uh, about the, uh, <laughs> I usually go, go well with my experience because I usually want to know my, what's my next step. Um, have that mindset of constant learning and invest in yourself. Uh, for example, me, I'm using the plan, do, check, act method to continuous improvement. I have smart objectives. I put it in place. I want to attain them. I didn't have actually very much of experience uh, in uh, the pre-project um, um, activities, but um, as I as I said earlier, I have the the knowledge, but I didn't have the opportunity to expand it in my experience. But I, I I'll do it in my future. So uh, of course I will um, I will share when I have more experience about that too. And absolutely, Ina, and I know that. Um... You mentioned you're always trying to think ahead, right? What is my next steps? Right? Yes. How can I better myself, right? And that's you, right. Uh, yeah. So uh, I usually say that uh, nobody has to remain in their comfortable routine and challenge yourself like every every single day, uh, because I started from the bottom actually uh, by taking this uh, uh, entry level DCBA uh, right now. Then before that, I got my uh, certificate from McGill. Now I'm studying for my agile. Um, analysis certificate because I'm not yet eligible to, to go for a certification in capability business analysis in the CCBA. So I want to uh, to prepare a little bit before I go to, to the next step. So you're I'm building, kind of preparing for my future. <laughs> you're building on that and I know that you've tried introducing uh, these notions of, you know, of strategic thinking into your own organization and sometimes you've hit a little bit of a wall. Uh, yes, uh, it's very 
difficult to bring a change when that change is not very, uh, you know, um, accepted. But uh, we don't need to um, uh, to accept it as is. We need to improve it, and we need to show it again and again. We need to show the value to our colleagues and uh, and explain that uh, this is going to be easier and better and and faster, of course, because it's all about speed nowadays, as we were talking before. Yes, the what's in it for me, right? The approach that yeah. that's always important. So these that's are right. you know these are big challenges, uh, and I think uh, George, you were going to introduces to the next notion of um you know what can we do about these challenges then? yeah so what can uh, business analysis capitalize on to bring value to their organization as well while fuel fueling their careers well of course we're we're here as talking about the about the academic uh, certification here uh, from uh, from uh, mcgill university um also what's what's really important this logo here is pretty important this academic program uh, member uh, McGill University School of Continuing Studies is one of the first in North America to be an IBA accredited academic partner uh, with the IBA. So again, what our course material is all uh, has been normalized by the IBA and all that. So that's that's something because you know teaching business analysis uh, and sharing business analysis is is one thing, uh, different techniques and all that, but also using a agnostic language, an international language, and this is why um, uh, McGill University is is uh, is a partner with the uh, the IB, uh, um, uh, the, the international or global organization, and the IBA represents members all over the world. Uh, there's, there's chapters in in every uh, every every continent on this uh, on this planet. So again, it's, it's very pleasing to know that we're working with with other BAs. Um, we're all working with BAs in other countries and all that. We're starting to use an agnostic. Uh, standardized language, and again, this is why uh, in our in our teaching material we, we leverage quite extensively the uh, business analysis body of knowledge from the IBA. Uh, the other the other aspect is a professional certification, which is external to to McGill University, is the um, all the professional cert uh, certifications within the IBA. Uh, what started out as one sole certification, which was the C uh, CBAP. Uh, probably started in about 2006. Uh, uh, today, we, we're up to seven certification. There are three general certifications at, the, at various levels, the entry level, the ECBA, CCBA, and CBA. And then there's uh, what's, what's trending again are the specialization certifications. So we have four um, specialized uh, certifications. When I say we have four, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a different hat. I'm wearing my, <laughs> my IBA volunteer uh, hat. But the um, uh, the four certifications are the Agile Analyst uh, certification that Ina was uh, was referencing uh, before, uh, the uh, CBDA, the, uh, the the Business Data Analytics uh, certification, and the the third one. I'm doing them in order. Uh, the third one was the CCA, which is a Cybersecurity uh, Certification Analysis uh, Certificate, and the, the last one is the uh, the POA, the Product Owner Analysis Certification. And again, it's trending. The certifications are trending to where uh, where the profession is going, also, which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, really really uh, neat. And you know, a lot of a lot of uh, younger BAs coming into the profession, they, are, they often ask uh, myself and Dulcy. And I'm sure Martin and Ina you know, the same questions. You know, where, where do I start? Should I specialize in one area, or should I become a generalist? Um, again, uh, kind of kind of the best answer for that is uh, you'd like to be a specialist generalist. You know, uh, polyvalence uh, is is probably the best uh, the best medicine to be super polyvalent. But then again, polyvalence doesn't get done in in one year. It's a journey. It's really a journey to uh, to acquire these skills, not only ac academically but also professionally. So um, uh, there's there's a couple of things that uh, areas that can be explored: the academic side, the professional side, and of, of course your your work uh, career planning side. And this, this is exactly what Ina was talking about. Um, thinking strategically as a BA. We need to plan out what will our career look like, or what should it look like for the next year, two years, five years. Where do I want to go? What areas do I want to uh, um, uh, 
specialize in and then maybe spend a couple of years in that area and then, then diversify a little bit. So uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's really a, a very vast uh, world, the world of business analysis. Yeah, I love that you said that, George, diversify. And, and Ina, you talked about to uh, know your next steps. I yeah. love that, right? So always have a, always have a vision of where you want to be. And the, uh, and the certifications are right there along with you, you know, uh, they keep growing. <laughs> So um, there's I was very uh, I was very happy when uh, coming into business analysis and finding that we have such a variety of certifications because uh, me as I was telling before I switched my career three times so I all the time I wanted to be certified all the time I started from the scratch all the time I started from the bottom and I wanted to learn how to do it. I, of course, learning from others is also a very good because you learn from their experience, but also you have to know the base. So that's why I'm going for the certificate first uh, and then uh, getting my experience along. Mm, that's fantastic. I, I'm looking at one of the visuals on this slide. We didn't touch upon it. I didn't touch upon it. And it's probably the most important one. It's the, the one right at the bottom in blue here, hard and soft skills. So <laughs> yes, there are the hard skills, but there's also the soft skills that we need to master. Since BAs, business analysts, we're always working with people, uh, mastering the soft skills is uh, is somewhat of an art. There is a science, but there's also an art to it, and it's something that we constantly have to work on. Um, I think of words like, in, uh, how can we engage our stakeholders better? How can we have fun? How can we gamify this? Um, how can we render it more more engaging? And especially when we're working in the in the world of uh, of remoteness or virtual, um, like we are right now on, on WebEx or Zoom or, or Meet or Google or Hangout or whatever, how can we engage them? A lot of the tools support some of these features like voting and, and surveys and breakout rooms and stuff like that. But how can we continually engage our, our stakeholders? And I think Mark, Martin, you probably have some ideas on, on some of these soft skills that and share with the audience well, here. yes well actually if you talk about the soft skill I, I would say that you know adaptability is the name of the game and we have the, to be adaptable we have to understand what we're doing uh, and the goal of these certification and the, uh, the 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 academic program is to have a good foundation uh, and you know usually foundations that they're hidden you know and people people need to know that we have these foundation and this is how it's how these certification works it helps build trust in ourselves and trust from the others so when we want when we want to be adaptable and try new things it's easier if we have the trust of the people if we, the project hits a roadblock and we suggest a, a different solution again uh, having the these certification helps building trust so as soft skill, I would say everything that has to do uh, with bringing value has to go with trust. Do people trust you as a business analyst? That's a good point you bring up about standards too, because uh, <laughs> when we're talking about cert uh, professional certifications, international professional certifications, um, we're working, we're working, we're living in a global village uh, today. And to uh, to be recognized, to have a certification that is uh, globally recognized, makes us uh, much more mobile. And not only physically mobile, we are now we're virtually mobile. In our classes, even uh, this year here in McGill, we have students from from Beirut, from France, from from uh, from, from all over. So uh, it is a it is a small uh, a small planet we're living on. And standardization is the key to that. And like you said, uh, Martin. Uh, that foundation, the vocabulary alone, yeah. is, uh, is something that we need to uh, to really embrace. Also, yeah, absolutely. So many challenges, but uh, but uh, together, learning from others, like you know, like you mentioned, um, and, um, and uh, having the trust of your stakeholders, of your the people you work with, Martin, uh, having the confidence of certification, that really helps us to grow as business analysts. And uh, actually, what uh, building on what we uh, what uh, George introduced as uh, McGill's uh, academic program um, uh, member with the IIBA, uh, we're actually going to have two information sessions about McGill's professional development certificate in business analysis. And um, there will be, uh, uh, you know, the links to those if you're interested will be published uh, by uh, McGill, just like it was for this particular session. 
and those the dates that you see there, July 6th and August 12th, to give people an opportunity to discover, uh, you know, what is what is the McGill's uh, Certificate in Business Analysis all about? Uh, and we talk about uh, some myths that we are demystified. We talked about what can you expect to make as a BA and uh, job opportunities and also we, we explore more the professional and academic certifications. Um, but uh, talking about job opportunities, I know that we have another slide uh, that uh, very quickly shows us all the courses in McGill's professional certificate. Um, so there's five courses that you have to take. There's three that are mandatory on the left, and then you choose two from the right. And once you're finished those five courses, then you receive McGill's uh, certificate and uh, professional development certificate in business analysis. And we'll explore that in those information sessions. Um, but um, uh, one of the things that we talk about is job opportunities. And what, uh, what we have here at McGill is the CATS team. Uh, they're not so much feline as they are a fantastic group to help uh, students get those jobs that they want after uh, or during, you know, their journey uh, in one of those uh, certificates. And we do have someone here from the CATS team, um, Nayo, Nayo Gaviapi, is yeah. going to tell us a little bit, a couple of minutes about uh, the CATS team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you, Dulce. Uh, and just thank you to everyone. Such a great conversation. Uh, so um, I'll be happy to tell you a few uh, main services here that I think will be helpful for everyone. Uh, so, my name is uh, Nagar uh, I'm a career advisor in the Career Advising and Transition Services of McGill, uh, but you can also call us uh, a chat. So, our services are really open to all SES students, alumni, and even potential students. So, whether you're looking for a job now, you're looking for a promotion, or interested in gaining the skills needed for tomorrow, well, we're here for you. So, I'll just let you know our most, uh, most popular, maybe more aligned with uh, uh, people here in the room. So we offer individual advising and coaching sessions to talk about almost anything career related, whether you're, you want to navigate the Montreal job market, optimize your LinkedIn profile, create a career action plan, or anything that could be career related. Uh, so I'll make sure to share with you uh, the link to uh, book an appointment. Uh, we also share soft skills training and uh, job search workshops. So as uh, Dulce and George were mentioning, uh, soft skills are extremely important, whether it's negotiation skills, communication, pitching, uh, emotional intelligence, and so much more. And um, we have community exchange via multiple social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we even have a brand new uh, mentoring platform. Uh, so it's for a uh, it's for SES students, but it's also open to the general populations, also to make sure that you're gonna be connected with employers, alumni, and other people within your industry. So this has proven to really be helpful uh, for people who use it. So if you're not already there, uh, we'll share the link and really strongly encourage everyone to join. Uh, we have, of course, internships, volunteering, recruitment event, company info session, and so much more. So really uh, make sure to just look at the website, go and register for the newsletter to stay up to date about all the most recent job offers and uh, yeah, and just uh, stay in touch with what's happening in uh, Montreal and around McGill. So we look forward to meeting you and uh, we are quite a huge team now. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this is my lovely team, which you'll have a chance to uh, hopefully meet uh, pretty soon. Thank you. Oh, fantastic, Nayo. And that annual job fair is always a hit, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. We've had a lot of pleasure. Of course, last year, uh, we had to put it on hold. <laughs> yes. Uh, different, uh, unique times. I still managed to the previous one, and I yeah. saw it's fantastic there. Thank you, Ina. That's excellent. So, um, so we hope that, uh, you know, this conversation about the future of of business analysis uh, was uh, interesting and um, and challenging and and uh, opened up a few doors uh, in your mind as well to the possibilities. And then we're going to bring this back to David. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your contributions. And thank you, Nayo, for telling everyone about CATS. We do have, we are nearing the end, but we do have a couple of minutes for questions. 
if you have a question, go ahead and send them to us. And uh, also, if you do want, you uh, can unmute yourself and speak to ask your question. I think you uh, you all must have done very well uh, in your in your presentation for there not to be uh, tons of questions. I think I saw a comment about portfolio portfolio management. I think um, before, but I think we touched on that. Yes, there was a comment that said I think that portfolio management aligned with business analysis is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Definitely is. Uh... When uh, when Dulcie was talking about the uh, you know, BAs being project centric, it's actually way beyond that right now. It, we're going program centric, portfolio centric, going at a higher level. And even before even the, before the portfolios are created, uh, you need you need to have business analysts to put in the, those portfolios in the first place. So mm -hmm. the uh, uh, thoughts of uh, things things like. Uh, Business architecture, enterprise architecture. How does this fit in? Um, do we need to create portfo uh, portfolios? How many? And within the portfolios, programs, and then within the projects and all that. So um, a profession that was was considered typically project uh, project centric is much much broader than that. And this is what the the the, the International Institute of Business Analysis and also the courses here at McGill University offer is that that much broader vision of business analysis than than conventionally what we were uh, were thinking. Awesome. Uh, my name is Sadap and I would like to uh, discuss. Uh, basically, I have um, done my graduation in business uh, in um, computer science and I have uh, uh, seven years of experience of business analysis in uh, my country in Pakistan. I moved to Canada and Montreal um, three years ago and uh, since three years I've not been working because I've been like engaged um, at home with my child and all that. So now my, uh, I would like to return to my profession and start working. Um, but uh, the problem I'm facing while searching the job here is that they say that I don't have the experience, professional experience of working in Canada. Uh, so um, I would like to ask what I need to do in order to uh, like uh, do that, because um, do I need to um, uh, do the IIBA certifications to get into the industry because if I see the, any other programs, all those theoretical things, I have already applied them during my uh, job in Pakistan. Okay. So, so yeah. I, I can answer part of the question or yeah, sure. some hints and tips. Um, international certification is a way of of uh, kind of rec 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 really recognize because. When talking about professional certification, you um, you not only have to know the academic sides of, of business analysis, but also have proven yourself in in your profession in any country, which means uh, you could uh, essentially meet some of the criteria to to probably uh, sit for an international certification um, application and exam, and that way, uh, again, in terms of uh, recruitment and stuff like that your CV becomes much more interesting and Neo will be able to talk to you much more about that. The other thing I would recommend is hanging out with BAs and the best place to hang out with BAs uh, other, other than the Guild University is at the IBA, is at the chapters, the local chapters. So if you're in the Montreal area, there's a Montreal chapter here. There's, uh, there's a chapter in Ottawa and there's also a chapter in Quebec City um, where there are chapters. There are recruiters. <laughs> there are because right now the market is hot. It's a hot market for BAs. You can imagine with the COVID, all the processes that had to be changed uh, very, very rapidly. So uh, the, the market is, is quite hot. So again, um, giving you a response in terms of the International Institute of Business Analysis and their certification to render yourself uh, your your profile. Uh, that much more attractive. Uh, maybe Dulce, you can talk to uh, some other points, and maybe Neo, you can add add to that too. Right, right. Uh, yeah, George, it, uh, it's so great what you were talking about uh, the chapter and also the recognition, the international recognition of uh, of uh, doing business analysis. And one of the things that we have to be better at is keeping a record of everything that we do as BAs. And so, uh, in order to you know take that exam. 
once you've proven that, you know, once you have the experience and you have the academics, you have to prove what experience that, uh, you know, what is the experience you have? And so we have to start by you. You mentioned, uh, say that I think you mentioned 7 years of experience in business analysis. So it would be important for you to start, you know, recording, uh, you know, according to the IIBA approach, what are all those activities that you did that match the, the business analysis body of knowledge? What is it? And uh, including, you know, project names and, and so forth and all that information you can actually find in the IIBA um, a website, you know, there is, uh, you know, a form that you can use to fill in uh, all those things. So details about what you did so that you can go uh, and, and do the exam and then you'll have that as one of the things to uh, present when you're searching for a job international recognition yes thank you uh, so really we can't really get better advices than what dulce and george are, are saying right now uh but other things that i've seen and i think your story is a lot more common uh then you can think so that so I see a lot of international students coming here or international professionals coming here looking for work and often yeah, arriving with the same challenge, but often just talking with employers, uh, meeting with them for informational interviews and really uh, showcasing how you have already all the experience that is needed and really just reassuring the employer connecting with them uh, will be super helpful and I've seen it uh, work very well on the field. Thank you, Remy. Thank, Thank you for, for sharing. If I if I can share something for you as well, I was um, in the office of the director of our professional development certificates one day, and she had a student there. It was actually a man from Pakistan who came to Canada and experienced something very similar to you. I think he actually was an engineer by training, but his uh, education in engineering was not recognized in Canada. And uh, he had enormous experience in project management, but decided that in order to break into the Canadian market, he would begin courses uh, in the professional development certificate in project management. And he said, you know, I have 20 years of experience, like I'm not going to learn anything. And uh, he started the course and he said, you know, he said, he said, going into the course, I know everything about project management. And then in the course, he said, I don't know anything about project management. So not only did he find that the McGill um, course and program was actually really enlightening and helpful, even though he had all that experience, it helped him break into the Canadian job market. And I think when Canadian employers see that you have a certificate from McGill, for example, when you have that Canadian education, that helps you break in because they see that you have something from Canada. So just, just a little uh, experience I had. Um, we have some other questions. So someone is asking for the link to the chapter in Montreal. Uh, could someone put that in the chat? That would be great. And we have a great question here uh, from Patrick. There seem to be two different streams of analysis, one focused on data science for IT with hard skills uh, in tools like Python, R, SQL, and another more business focused path using tools like Tableau and Excel. Uh, what is your opinion on which one is more important or becoming more important and sought after in organizations? Wow. Great question. Yeah. And the answer has two words. It depends. It de yeah. I was <laughs> expecting really, that from you, George. <laughs> it, it really it depends. Uh, um, it is very vast. I mean, so some people are looking at, they say, two streams. And if you look at Delvin's diagram, Delvin Fletcher, the CEO of uh, IBA, he shows, I think, on that spoke uh, uh, hub and spoke model, there's probably about uh, 10 spokes to that to that model. Uh, but again, it, it, it depends. I often say, you know, go with your passion, go with your passion first. Um, you know, something might be trending, but it, it's, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't appeal to your, to your passion or your heart. Um, uh, go with your passion. And, um, it's probably, it's probably the best uh, advice I could, uh, I, I could give you. I've, I look at my personal career, um, back 30 years, 35 years ago, I wasn't targeting this particular profession, but, you know, opening 1 door led to 3 doors open to those 3 doors led to another 18 other doors. Um, and then I says that really, that really. It, it vibes with me 
And so I, I always say, go with the passion. Yes, there, you'll read some Harvard Business Review articles on all oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Maybe for some people, but not for everybody. So again, go with your passion. So, so good. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You have to know a little bit about everything, <laughs> but if you want to specialize, I, you know, I remember having conversations about, uh, I've always, I always thought, you know, data modeling is a, I love that, talk, you know, data modeling. It's a passion for me, but other people, you know, even though they know, they understand data modeling, they don't like it. So they, they don't want a job in that. They want to, you know, go with something that they love, George. And absolutely. You're so right. Great. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like that is all, all of our questions for this evening. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, we wish you all the best in your uh, business analysis or career journey. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Martin and Nina also. Thank, thank you. you. As you're having yeah. my cup. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, my water. <laughs> Thank you, George and Dulce. Take care. Have a great Take night, everyone. Good night. Thank Merci you. tout le monde. Bye. Merci. 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 Au Merci. Au Bonne soirée. Thank you. Avoir su qu'on pouvait parler français, je l'aurais fait avant. Oh, <laughs> oui, vas-y. <laughs> <laughs> ben, maintenant, euh, on peut... Euh, si tu as des questions, Parfait. tu peux poser en français, on est toujours là. On oui, est, on ben, est trois. en fait... Je suis architecte d'entreprise à Hydro-Québec, donc euh, je suis tombé euh, par hasard, je pense, sur un post LinkedIn sur euh, euh, ce webinaire-là, puis c'est vraiment intéressant. Euh, je fais beaucoup de parallèles avec ce que je fais, puis euh, on a beaucoup de difficultés avec la mise en place de, de, du business analysis. C'est quelque chose encore qui est vu comme euh, une niche, euh, une spécialité, puis euh, c'est beaucoup langue technologique qui est pris en premier lieu, donc euh, c'est intéressant. Euh, tous les liens qui se font avec euh, Lightill, avec euh, le modèle SAFE, euh, avec l'agilité, avec euh, les value streams, c'est euh, très peu compris, donc euh, moi, votre formation m'intéresse beaucoup en tout cas. Oui, puis ça, ça attache beaucoup les IBA avec le Summit et vous êtes membre du, du BAG, du uh, Business Architecture Guild. Et le BizBoc, que seulement vous connaissez le BizBoc, b i z b o k euh, qui est rendu à sa version 10. Incroyable euh, comment cette, euh, le BAG, le, le Business Architecture Guild, euh, a eu sa naissance. Assez récemment, je dirais peut-être dans les six <rire> dernières années. Puis euh, c'est vraiment incroyable. Puis comment ça touche aussi euh, l'analyse d'affaires l'analyse d'entreprise de, et, et, et tous les, tous les autres euh, facettes. Mais l'architecture d'affaires, euh, euh, il y a peut-être il y a dix ans, il n'y avait pas beaucoup de livres là-dessus même. Tu sais, on parlait de Zachman Model, mais maintenant on voit le TOGAF, on voit toutes sortes de frameworks qui, qui, qui sont là, incluant des, des certifications. TOGAF sont rendus, je pense, à 9.3, je pense, en certification et tout. Fait que, euh, puis on parle de de d'autres uh, frameworks aussi. Uh, okay. On essaie de faire, uh, on était uh, Zachman et BN uh, autour de 2006. On, est, là, ouais. on essaie de faire un virage vers uh, TOGAF et IT, ouais. uh, on essaie d'aller vers uh, IT for IT ouais. et uh, du Open Group qui est très intéressant aussi. Ouais. Puis c'est uh, toute une transition parce ouais. que le, le on visuel. A, oui, on a comme trois gros secteurs euh, difficiles à, à attacher ensemble. Dans le fond, le, la gestion de projet est encore vue comme euh, une niche, puis euh, mm. les, les gens ne suivent pas nécessairement l'agilité, la, 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 puis tout ce qui s'en vient avec euh, le, ce que peut apporter les TOGAF, euh, les, nouveaux, les nouveaux cadres de, de référence comme ça. Donc, euh, ce qui est intéressant qu'on trouve, c'est que les techniques d'analyse d'affaires qu'on qu pratique, puis qu'on étudie, puis qu'on enseigne, mais on peut appliquer ces mêmes techniques dans diverses euh, facettes. Exactement. Euh, c'est ça, parce que le, le, le contenu, ce n'est pas juste le contenant. T'sais, on parle souvent de gestion de projet, la façon de faire, c'est le contenant. Mais ce qui, est, ce qui est dans le contenant, le contenu, c'est ouais. apprendre des techniques d'analyse d'affaires qui peuvent être utilisés avant les projets, pendant les projets, après les projets. C'est les mêmes techniques qu'on apprend et qu'on tu sais, qu 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 peut déployer, en fait. Hein? Exact. C'est très difficile, l'avant-projet. 
Chez mmh. nous, c'est comme deux secteurs différents. Fait que ce qui se fait en avant projet n'est pas financé de la même... C'est pour ça que j'ai posé la question ouais. sur le portfolio, parce ouais. que c'est une difficulté qu'on a. Les gens ont tendance à... Il euh, y a comme deux modes, là, si je parle euh, CAPEX, OPEX, euh, oui, ça devient euh, ouais, ouais. long ouais. dans un autre game. Là. Un autre monde. <rire> oui. Puis là, il faut recommencer quand, on, quand on, on commence le projet, c'est comme un autre monde encore. Tu sais. Oui, on essaye d'agiliser de, de, ce processus-là, oui. justement, de, de venir l'uniformiser pour qu'il n'y ait pas un bris euh, de, de ce côté-là. Ah, bon. Euh, oh, mais... C'était vraiment intéressant hein, de, savoir, de, de vous avoir là-dedans, puis euh, peut-être on pourra en discuter une autre fois dans d'autres sessions. Oui, puis, si vous avez la chance de, de venir aux sessions de, du IBA, souvent on, on a des sessions dédiées au, au, à l'architecture d'affaires, euh, puis, euh, puis on, a, on a des membres sur, que, que Dossé et moi connaissons, ça fait plusieurs années où on est sur le, le conseil, qui sont, euh, c'est leur métier, c'est oui, de l'architecture oui. d'affaires, mais ils sont, sont, dans, sont, sont avec nous dans l'IBA dans parce qu'il y, y a des analystes d'affaires qui spécialisent euh, dans, dans l'architecture. Je, je pense à Yves, euh, qu'on travaille avec, là, Yves Nicole, qui était au oui, STM. Oui. Euh, et puis euh, encore, c est, c est, il, y a, il y a des défis, c'est certain. Puis les communications, c'est quelque chose qu'on on pense qu'on maîtrise, mais en architecture d'affaires, c'est encore plus important les communications. Il faut qu'on qu communique de tout bas, de tout côté, à, à tout niveau. Tu sais, euh, oui. Il faut vraiment qu'on soit euh, extrêmement polyvalent. Mais je, je suis un petit peu exposé. Et puis je, je me rends compte là, de, en architecture d'affaires, tranquillement, tout vite, je, je travaille avec un, un, un architecte, de, 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 un business architect là, à mon travail. Là. Puis je me rends compte que c'est ça, la communication puis l'engagement. C'est un, un monde qui est complexe. Puis euh, c'est obtenir l'engagement le, des gens pour continuer les processus. À un moment donné, il y a quelqu'un qui a dit l'expression, on parle souvent de comment on mange un éléphant, ben, une bouchée à la fois. Là. Mais là, il y a quelqu'un qui, qui, qui on lui a exposé ça, puis il a dit, ben là, c'est pas un éléphant, c'est un troupeau d'éléphants. <rire> oui, OK, mais un morceau à la fois, on peut y arriver. <rire> L'engagement de, de l'analyse d'affaires, il travaille fort. Là. Le concept d'engagement de soft skills, là, il travaille fort. Ça m'a pas plaisir euh, d'échanger avec vous. Moi, je suis euh, à nouveau à l'architecture euh, TI, donc euh, je suis un, un, un de ceux qui a monté euh, des opérations, si je peux dire ah, comme oui. ça. Vous donc, connais ça. Euh, ouais. Oui, c'est ça. Je connais le terrain. Maintenant, j'essaie de, de me rendre dans les étages supérieurs. Donc, euh, mm -hmm. je, fais le, je, fais, je marche l'ascenseur et j'essaie de marcher euh, les ah, processus d'attacher tout ça, donc ça va me faire plaisir euh, de rentrer euh, si vous pouvez poster des liens. On a, on a mis le montréal.iba.org alors c'est pour, euh, pour savoir qu'est-ce qui se passe euh, qu sont... là on, on achève là, parce que là on est rendu pour l'été euh... oui. hein? oui. on... mais Et, vous pouvez euh... aller dans, dans les événements passer, puis euh, vous pouvez passer à travail rapidement, il y a beaucoup des, des gens qui présentent, c'est des thèmes différents, puis il y en a plusieurs dans les dernières années euh, qui ont présenté sur l'architecture d'affaires, euh, même il y a plusieurs années, il y a eu des gens, même de hydro québec ont, 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 j'ai des amis à Hydro qui sont, qui étaient là en enseignement, puis euh, en architecture d'affaires, fait que on pourrait te, je pourrais te mettre en contact avec eux aussi. Ça généreux, donc c'est très gentil. Merci okay. beaucoup. Thanks everyone. Uh, I understand pretty well in English, but I don't speak well, so I don't have the chance to speak in English. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir. I don't know if I can still pick.